So welcome everybody. My name is Carla Witherington. I'm the community engagement and special projects manager with the town of Cary. And with that role, I am lucky enough to get to run our Cary 101 program. And I know it's been a crazy year, so I just wanted to quickly remind everybody about the process for Cary 101 this year, what that looks like, and um, the people who are listening in on the call tonight. So it was back in early February, we opened applications for the Citizens Academy, known as Cary 101, is formerly School of Government. And that application period closed on February 21st. And by early March, um, a group of staff had selected 24 out of the 44 applicants to participate in this year's program. And the first session was supposed to be held on Tuesday, March 24th. Of course, the coronavirus had other plans. So unfortunately, on March 13th, I had to announce to this year's participants that the program would be postponed. Couldn't even get one session in. So we're still waiting to hold that full eight week long program, but we did wanna go ahead and invite those participants to join us for this special event tonight. And I know we can't see your faces, but we are very grateful that you all are here and eager to learn about your local government. Um, as a reminder, tonight's event will be recorded so that we can share this information with other staff and citizens later on. And it will also be shared with any of your fellow Carry 101 participants who were unable to attend on the live call tonight. So welcome again. Thank you for being here. We hope that you will find tonight's session informative and that you'll enjoy this opportunity to check in with Carrie's leadership team. And speaking of leaders, who better to kick us off than our very own mayor, Harold Weinbrecht. Mayor, thank you so much for dropping in tonight. Thank you for having me. Uh, I do want to uh, welcome everyone and thank you for being Carry 101 participants and waiting almost the entire year <laughs> to get started. Uh, on behalf of the council, I would like to congratulate each of you for being chosen to participate in this program. It's it's a very competitive process, so you've accomplished something just by being selected. And each year I'm impressed with the participants that are selected, and, and I've seen some of the names that look familiar uh, participating. So uh, I look forward to seeing those folks once again, and for those I haven't met, I look forward to meeting you one day. Don't know when that day will be, but I do look forward to meeting you. As was mentioned, Cary 101 started out as a citizen's college, and that happened in, uh, the first one was in, in 2003, and uh, it was created to give our citizens a chance to learn about their government. And as it was then, it's the same as now. There's several sessions that will give you insight into the local government that serves you and, uh, and the services that we provide to you. And hopefully, after you graduate from this program, uh, you'll have knowledge to be an ambassador and want to be an ambassador for your community. And I hope that this program is just the beginning of your civic service. Now, all through the year, Cary has multiple opportunities to volunteer. And currently, we're accepting applications for our committees to Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Advisory Board and information about all volunteers and volunteering opportunities are on the town's website and you can find it there. Uh, many of our graduates also volunteer their time in community nonprofits and their HOAs. Now this is very important because those organizations can really benefit from having someone that knows all about the town and all about the town services like yourselves as you will be graduates. So it's great to have uh, Carry 101 graduates out in these organizations, which also helps the town. Well, as was mentioned, this year has been kind of strange, weird, and even now, seven months later, I'm not used to the new normal, but I'm trying. Uh, but the fact that you're interested in your community and you're on this call says a lot about you and says a lot about our community by you wanting to be engaged and learn about your community during this time. And it's been an honor to be your mayor and to have the opportunity to speak 
with you this evening, and I hope the rest of the program is enjoyable. I'm looking forward to seeing what's in the rest of the program, um, and I ask you to continue to be safe and stay healthy. So back to you, Carla. Thank you, Mayor. Well said. I appreciate the plug for Carry 101 and appreciate you taking the time to recognize this group and their commitment to staying involved with the community. Next up, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Cary Town Manager, Sean Stiegel. Sean has been with us just over four years now, and I think several of us employees would agree that we've been very fortunate to have him, especially during the pandemic. And after hearing him describe how our culture and values have served as a framework for our response to COVID-19, I hope that you guys too will appreciate his approach. Over to you, Sean. Thank you so much, Carla. Thanks, Mayor, for kicking us off, and thanks uh, to everybody who's participating. Well, working in, in Cary right now, as the Mayor had mentioned, um, in, in many ways, uh, we share an experience that really everybody does to a certain degree in, in dealing with what is a very difficult year. Although that we're reminded for us, it's not as difficult as it is for those that have been stricken with COVID, those have uh, businesses that have been impacted, and those that have been hurt economically in any way. So as, as difficult as this year has been, we are uh, reminded that there are people that are suffering much more, and we have really tried to align our efforts this year you know, from the mayor and the council down through the staff to trying to identify those who in carry, who are in need and when are being impacted and how we can play a role in that. And so as, as how that relates to Kerry's culture, you know, for I've been here four years, but for decades, uh, Kerry uh, has been built on a premise of being a community that is a government that's accessible by its community and a community that by choice uh, through people such as you who are participating in their government and have made it something special. And so uh, as we all know, Cary is a community that is made up of people that are from somewhere else. And almost by definition, at least in my little focus group of you know the hundreds of people that I have met upon my arrival have talked about, you know, their they introduce themselves by their name, they tell you where they're from. Maybe one or two are actually from Cary, um, which is always a, a kind of like finding a, a diamond in the rough. They tell you how long they've been here, and then in some version they talk about you know, why why Carrie is um, has changed their life for the better as compared to where they were living before and that's that's no accident that is I think the, through the will and determination of people that have moved here over the years there's been a collective effort a very focused effort by the citizens here which has been who's ultimately reflected in the council to create something that is very special and so I know when I was fortunate enough to come here four years ago Carrie North Carolina had represented uh, to me a dream job and somewhere that I was familiar with Carrie uh, through uh, visits that somewhere if I was able to be the town manager in Cary, North Carolina, that I will have accomplished a lifelong dream. And ever since then, it really has been. This year during the COVID, what we have done at the town of Cary is taken this idea of partnering with our citizens uh, trying to be fine areas, I said before, where we can play an, an ever increasing positive role in the lives of our citizens and try to find a way to remain adaptable. And so the idea of adaptability, which is something that we've been working on for several years, almost by definition, when you think of flexibility and adaptability, you don't, usually government doesn't come to mind. You know, you think of you think of tech companies or you think of, you know, a positive experience that you've had with um, any type of organization which has found a way to be able to meet your individual needs and not um, being responded to kind of an overly bureaucratic way. So at the at the time of carry for the last four years, we have really tried to emphasize how can we still have our processes and procedures, which are a very important and necessary part of, of government because you have to have equity and representation, but also how can we find a way to continue to tailor our services and needs to our individual homeowners where it does and can make sense. And so going through that type of change, a real kind of a shift in mindset, and, and that shift in mindset represented not, 
not throwing out what Carrie had become, because like I said, this is my dream job. So by definition, Carrie was not broken. It just needed to advance to an even, even higher level of government service. And we've been able to do that. And probably the biggest testament to that has been over the last year or well, last night not year, feels like 10 years, but since uh, late February of this year, when essentially everything that we knew to be true on a daily basis came to came to an end. Okay, so uh, while we had never been through a pandemic before, what we had done collectively, uh, our, the employees and with our citizens, in some way, all of us have been through difficult challenges and found ways to be successful in spite of the challenges that were presented in front of us. And so since you, if, you, there's, if you can't change the situation, I and mean, any of us would end the pandemic if we could, unfortunately, that is beyond um, the skill set of any of us. We just try to make the best out of the situation. And so the best out of the situation was allowing our organization to demonstrate how they could operate independently when everybody now is collectively in a campus, but they're populated throughout the organization. And it's given opportunities for other employees, two are on my screen right now, Carla and Alan, to be able to assume even greater leadership responsibilities and authority and use their talents and skills to add value to the town of Cary and our citizens. And so the adaptability, um, the flexibility, the seeing the bigger picture, not just focusing on the thing that's in front of you, but trying to connect those dots which we really emphasize over the past couple of years, really has paid off when the, when the pandemic started. And the reason for that is, is if you've tried to de-emphasize hierarchy and de-emphasize the number of bosses you have in the organization, you've grown people's resilience and ability to, to do self-directed work. And so we have, it hasn't been an organization that has been lost, even though we've never done this before, we knew how to work together very successfully, and we just had to find a different way of doing that. And so when the relationships are strong, the talent is strong, and the commitment to the talent carries strong, and the support of our citizens and the council um, and understanding and kind of cheering us on, which is which has been something that we've we've really come to enjoy in Cary. Um, the citizens uh, uh, give us a lot, they expect a lot, and we try to meet them there, and that propels our work. And so it's been it's been a very kind of positive situation within the larger context of, well, of course it's not ideal, but we've really tried to make the most of it. Some other things that, that have really benefited us during the last year, in addition to being just experts in emergency response and knowing how to deal with that, and you'll hear from Alan here soon, who is um, a top level professional in the area of public safety. And now um, he can add public health to that uh, kind of um, experience list, but we've had 311. So in February of the, in January of this year, we launched 311, meaning that people can call for whatever reason they find necessary. Um, the way we talk about it, you have a burning building, you call 911. You have a burning question, you call 311. Well, that was based upon a certain number of call volume and that we had expected to build over several years. Well, instantly, Cary became a retirement community because everybody's working from home. And I don't know um, if this happens to you, but the more that people are home, the more they see things or take the time to maybe call in about things that they otherwise wouldn't have. So we've had a deluge of, of contacts with our, contact with our citizens, which has allowed us to um, have experiences with some citizens that maybe before they haven't connected with the town of Cary. So while it has been a major challenge, it's been navigated um, successfully. And really that comes from a cultural underpinning of that has been around for a long time of finding a way to serve our citizens because we really do try to put our citizens the first at everything that we do and that value permeates from the mayor and the council me all the way down through the staff and one thing that we say and i'll, I'll wrap up here and turn it over to alan is um if, if we occasionally run across an employee that really doesn't enjoy working for citizens they're really in the wrong business and so a part of it is to work successfully in local government, you have to love the process of serving citizens and elected officials and the team here at the town of Cary does. And we appreciate the time that you've given to us tonight. Uh, we appreciate your support, but we also appreciate your feedback in any areas where we can't, we can't get better unless people tell us how, because uh, sometimes there's things, the things we don't know, we don't know. 
but we're always receptive to those comments and try it again to be very different than many governments in that regard. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Carla. Thanks, Sean. We do appreciate that message. Thanks. Um, and like Sean said, um, now that we've heard a bit about our organization's approach to addressing the pandemic, let's dive into the actual virus itself. So joining us tonight is Public Safety Director Alan Kane. Alan, I know it's been a long six or seven months now of responding to the coronavirus, but can you talk to us about the processes that we put in place back in March and how things look today? Good evening, uh, everyone. I wish that I could see your face and uh, ask questions, um, but we are where we are today with this. I was actually going to lead with a question for, um, for the group, and so um, I'm not going to be able to do that, but if I still have Carla on the on the line here, if you can hear me, I'm going to ask you uh, this question. And so, as you mentioned, it's, it's related to um, the COVID-19, the coronavirus. Um, and I will talk a little bit about uh, Carrie's uh, response to that over the last several months. But, but I want to ask the question because I've been saving it up for everybody. Um, does, or, or can we do it in the chat? Can we ask it in the chat? I think we can. Okay. Ryan might be the only one that can see it, but yeah. You know. What did you want me to ask? Yeah, so we will. Oh, I just want to ask uh, our participants um, where in where was the first COVID 19 case identified in North Carolina? Can anyone tell us that? I don't want to answer. I'll see if someone <laughs> Yeah, let's see if anyone has that. All right, I'm getting some answers. We've got somebody said Charlotte. Somebody said Chatham County. <laughs> Chatham County. Wake County. No. Neither. What? All right. Did, has anyone guessed Carrie? Nope. All right. Well, Carrie is the answer. And so the first COVID 19 uh, diagnosis in or a case that was positive case that was reported was in Carrie back in early uh, March of this year. And a lot of people don't know that, and it's a uh, it's an interesting little fact. Um, but what we uh, what what happened with that one case? It put into a, um, a uh, it put into motion a series of actions that um, that the town has taken to respond to this uh, COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. And I want to talk just a little bit about a little behind the scenes uh, look about what we've done, and um, and share uh, as Carla mentioned basically where we are now. And so early March, um, we had this uh, positive case identified in, in Cary, and within a week or so, our governor uh, issued a state, um, uh, excuse me, a disaster declaration, declaration uh, for our state and issued uh, a number of restrictions. And so with the, with the governor's uh, disaster declaration, our mayor, whom you heard from earlier, and we have a photo of catching the mayor here and doing some mayoral work. Um, he issued a state of emergency for the town on uh, March the 16th. And um, actually, this is really an important authority that the mayor uh, has. It's one of um, the few unilateral authorities that uh, the mayor has. Uh, he, he issued a state of emergency. With uh, that outlined a number of actions that we were going to take as a community. Uh, primarily, that was to follow the governor's um, restrictions and phased reopening plan, and um, also with the with the mayor's uh, state of emergency declaration, we activated our emergency operations center, which I will talk about uh, a bit. And as we did that, because we operated this, um, as we activated this emergency operations center. Uh, it placed us in um, very close contact, daily contact, ongoing contact with Wake County public health officials and our local hospital, Wake Med uh, Cary Hospital. And these were important connections um, to make as we navigated through this um, really un unknown uh, public health emergency uh, with the COVID-19 uh, virus. And so another question. Uh, for folks, and uh, anyone can answer. We'll put this out. Does uh, anyone know? Are we still under the mayor's state of emergency? Yes or no? All right, and I'm viewing. I'm getting yes, yes, yes. Yes. Many yeses. 
Yes. Yeah. We we are we we remain under the mayor's uh, state of emergency, and we will do so un until we have a very clear path um, to reopening our community without restrictions uh, that will not further endanger um, its safety, health, and welfare of our citizens and and our town uh, and our town staff. And that gets back that premise gets back to the values um, work that uh, Sean talked about uh, earlier. So. Um, with, but with the mayor's um, state of emergency, we activated an emergency operations center. And so this is a little bit of, a, uh, of an unknown uh, local government function. And I just want to talk briefly about it. So on the screen, you have a very simple and colorful uh, organizational structure that really outlines the major sections or the major components of an emergency operations center. And um, on my screen, there's, um, there's the there's a blow up screen that's over a blue bubble. Can everybody else see that? Can you see the blue bubble? Yes. Carl, okay, you can see the, it's mine, it's occluded on my screen, but it, that is a, an important part of the emergency operations center structure. It's the, the structure known as the policy group. And really that is where the mayor uh, and the town manager reside. And I wanna talk a little bit about the relationship of the policy group to the emergency operations center structure. And so for those who may not know, um, whenever, many times, whenever states of emergencies are declared, local government units will activate this parallel or matrix uh, organizational structure in order to address the specific nuances or the specific demands or needs of this uh, particular emergency. And it may be a hurricane or a winter storm, but in our case, it was the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we have, this organization within an organization that is functioning on its own with a focus on responding to the pandemic. And again, I will not go over the, um, the major sections here, but what is happening is we're, we're, we're bringing in people to this organization structure from across the organization on a temporary basis, but temporary in as long or in as much as um, the emergent need um, requires. And so under this, do we have a person who's in charge of the EOC? That's known as the incident commander or the EOC manager. And over time, uh, earlier this year, our police chief and fire chief and 311 director all served in that particular role. And then under the operations section, we have contact. So we have a structure in place. And I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, what that space looks like in just a minute. But we have a structure in place so that the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, is making contact with all the other services, and this is why it's an important parallel function. We, in as much as we're responding to the pandemic itself and listening to uh, the governor and listening to Dr. Mandy Cohen uh, talk about uh, preventative measures and restrictions, and so we have to work within that. There's also at the same time, there are many, many other town staff who are working in our water treatment and wastewater treatment plants, police officers are, uh, continue to work, firefighters continue to report uh, to duty. And then um, in, in this spring also deemed essential personnel were a lot of the people in our um, development um, review process and development compliance process. So many building inspectors and, um, and infrastructure inspectors were working as, as well. And so there are the normal functions of the town that are ongoing and then also to these functions in the town that, that relate specifically to the pandemic. And so the purpose of the Emergency Operations Center is to take the information that we get from both um, uh, other town uh, staff, which would come through this operations section, or take information that we might get from the Wake County Public Health Department or the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services that help shape and formulate um, uh, the policy decisions that the town would make. And so this EOC structure takes that information, uh, assembles that information, analyzes that information, and then really makes uh, policy recommendations to that policy group. So the mayor and the town manager then can act on these policies, decisions that need to be made, such as, are we gonna have a curfew? Are we gonna implement a curfew? Or what businesses, um, uh, how are we going to uh, do enforcement actions? And we'll talk a little bit more about the pandemic enforcement actions in a bit. All these ideas, how are we going to um, operate our parks and rec and cultural resources programs and other 
um, other programs and services that the town provides, but because we're in a pandemic, we have to ask the question, is this something we need to do at the time? So this EOC structure takes that information, analyzes it, and makes recommendations to the policy group. Um, it also, too, is a, a, a source of, um, uh, of communication. And so when those decisions are made, they're disseminated in a highly structured fashion to the appropriate um, to the appropriate stakeholders. And so the EOC has, um, those are the two primary roles. And then the secondary role is to ensure that those people that are, are operating in the field, such as police officers and firefighters, they get the essential equipment that they need or resources that they need in order to provide the function. So this is, um, this is the nature of the work of the Emergency Operations Center. Cary's Emergency Operations Center uh, started off in our um, police department training uh, room. We, we ran and operated for a number of weeks on an in-person basis. And so every day for seven days a week, 12 hours a day, people would come and they would occupy these seats. And then after a couple of months, we, um, we transitioned to a virtual uh, emergency operations center. So this is actually an emergency operations center at work, but it's the virtual version where people are either in their office, that obviously they're socially distanced, or maybe they're, they might even be uh, at home. And so we, we've operated um, uh, the emergency operations center for about five and a half months, starting off in person, transitioning to, um, uh, to a virtual environment. And then at the end of um, August, I believe we actually, um, for the COVID response, we stopped uh, meeting uh, virtually and now we're only reactivating on an as needed basis. During that time, our, our, our physical space changed though. So whenever we have to um, reinstitute or reactivate the emergency operations center, we have a new space that was built into the fire station on Walnut Street. And so this, um, this new space takes the place of that old space whenever we need to, uh, whenever we need to reactivate. So that's a little bit about um, how the EOC evolved and what it looks like and how it functions and what its uh, three primary purposes are. These are all important um, activities for a community to take um, because, and in, the, in this particular case, um, the consequences are, are, are great. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what is often, um, uh, what often gets lost about the significance or the magnitude of the coronavirus. And this is particularly important now because I think many, many members of our citizenry uh, members of the public, I think people probably on this call, we are we probably feel in many ways like we are tired and done of of COVID, and um, that's certainly understandable. It last much lasted much longer than any hurricane or winter storm has ever lasted, but it is still of a real concern. And so, I just want to share just some data with you about the leading causes of death in the U.S. and in North Carolina, and kind of put these things in perspective. The most recent information that excuse me, the most recent data that the CDC provided was back from 2017. But if you look at, if you look at these, um, these leading causes, the first, second, third cause, they are all basically the same today as they were back in, in 2017. They rarely change. But you see the numbers here, and I won't dwell too much on the numbers, but, um, but we know that um, as of today, 209,000 um, U.S. citizens have died from uh, the COVID-19 virus. And that puts it, that knocks it, that knocks the number three leading cause of accidents out. It's far exceeded uh, that by, what is that, 40,000 people, and it's really only seven months old. And I, again, I'm comparing data sets here. The COVID-19 number is to date for 2020. I'm just trying to create a context for what typically are the leading causes of death in the U.S. So these numbers that you see heart disease, cancer, and accidents, they are all four years old, but again, the hierarchy um, where, they, where they land in that order remains about the, about the same. And so if we drill down a little bit and we uh, present uh, the North Carolina data, you see there are a lot of similarities with the U.S. data. Cancer is a leading cause of death. And then uh, and number six are complications from all, Alzheimer's. And then as of today, earlier today on the NCDHHS website, um, COVID-19 deaths in the state are coming in now at the seventh leading cause in the state at, um, 
3,670. So this is why this still remains an important issue, or, or uh, remains an incredibly important public health um, challenge for uh, not only our community, but uh, for the state and for the nation. And it's uh, part of my job is to remind people about that. And so I'm gonna take a little bit uh, closer look in Cary and um, the, um, you should see a table here that we've uh, been tracking uh, since April, since late April, and it shows the incremental increases in carry COVID uh, cases by date. So it's, it's running on about um, uh, a weekly period here, and the last data from the from the end of last week, uh, the number of positive carry uh, number of positive COVID cases in carry was at 1,542, and that was a 3.6 percent increase over the week uh, prior to that. And so we see. The numbers have not um, have not leveled off. There's still an incremental growth there, and so we we as a community, uh, we really need to remain vigilant. And if we take a, another look at that, put it in a, the greater context of what's happening across our county, this is um, a chart and some data that um, I, re I watch closely um, because it tells a very interesting story. I think, and although we cannot uh, draw any conclusions. Um, from just one data point, I do think it's representative uh, and reflective of the ac uh, actions and activities and uh, events within our community. And so this is the number of uh, carry, uh, um, the number of cases of COVID-19 per 1,000 residents for all of the municipalities within Wake County. And so on um, it's per 1,000 residents, so it's normalized across the county. And you'll see at 8.97, uh, Cary remains the, um, the municipality with uh, with the the lowest rate um, per 1,000 residents. Although we have the second largest rate um, of population uh, within the county, and of course we've excluded uh, the um, unincorporated areas at 2.28 because they they um, uh, they're uh, that built upon uh, uh, environment is just significantly different. And so, uh, what I believe this um, what I believe this um, chart shows is a community that has responded well to the uh, request and direction and guidance that our public health officials have provided for us. And, um, oh, oh, and at 8.97 per 1,000 residents, that equates to, if you extrapolate that out, that's about 18 deaths that have, that have occurred in Cary uh, over the last seven months as a result of COVID. And so um, I'm gonna go on my, um, public health PSA reminder uh, today, because I don't think we can say this enough as a community. I also agree that, and I'll back this up with a little more data here in a second. I think we've been very good at um, maintaining our uh, compliance and diligence with the three W's that Dr. Mandy Cohen talks about uh, frequently in her, in her press briefings. And so wear your face covering, keep that socially distant six feet apart and wash your hands or use sanitizers uh, regularly. So we need to do that. And um, again, this is another, this is just another um, uh, snapshot at how, why I think that uh, we do a, a really good job of that. So this is the compliance data um, that we've maintained over the last seven months in, in tracking the complaints uh, or calls that either our police department or our 311 um, center that Sean mentioned earlier has received about compliance with the governor's executive orders and the three W's. And so the police department over the last seven months, they've responded to about just a little over 500 calls um, for people making complaints about others, not necessarily following the executive orders. You can see the breakdown about where that um, occurs. And it's interesting there, um, about 20% uh, of those occurred in, in parks. And so it, it, over time, people want to be in the park so much and they want to get out so much, they were even removing signs in the park so that it didn't appear as if they were violating the order. And then uh, the three one cases, we've um, we've ca uh, cataloged 576 of those cases. Um, 190 of those were just inquiries about what services were the town providing and what facilities might be um, might be open. And then 86 of those um, related to executive order compliance. And so when you look at the police department calls and the three one one calls, I think these are incredibly um, low numbers for a community. And which, uh, uh, in, in terms of number of numbers of complaint, uh, we get 
as many or more complaints about neighborhood speeding or noises than we do for COVID-19 calls. And again, I think that's just reflective of the um, response that our community has made. And I'm wrapping up here. Uh, I know you said, Carla, that we'd ask questions at the end, but I did have a question slide here, but that's also an indicator that, um, that I'm finished. Thank you, Alan. I'm uh, definitely one of those people who was getting tired, so I appreciate the, uh, the reminder. Although it's a skill set that we never want to have to apply again, I am proud of how many of our colleagues stepped up to work in the EOC. I think it was actually kind of sad to see your slide of the hierarchy, the chart. It's so familiar to me now. I was in the planning section for several months, so it's, um, I don't know if I would call it an opportunity, but it was certainly an experience um, to get to work in the EOC. All right, we're gonna go ahead and jump right back into things. So our next speaker is going to be our deputy town manager, Russ Overton. We heard from Alan about our response to COVID-19, but Russ is going to tell us more about how we've kept the machine running, all of those day-to-day -day services and projects that are still moving forward. Russ, thank you for being here. Thank you, Carla. And like the mayor and Sean, I really wanna thank everybody for their interest in our community. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about keeping the machine running, if you will, is a term we use. Uh, but really, I'm going to talk to you about what our operational framework was during the pandemic. And I'm especially going to highlight some of the early weeks or months, uh, which was actually kind of hard to remember. I was, I was kind of putting together my thoughts on this now. I think it's only fitting to go after Alan. Uh, he and I have done a little you know, something like these presentations before, but I jokingly say that the operations frame, framework team worked everything left from Alan and the EOC. Um, in other words, Alan and his team certainly did the heavy lifting on the emergency for this. And Alan mentioned um, COOP services or the, our continuity of operations plan and those services being like fire, police, utilities, sanitation, which is out of public works, inspections and permits or inspections that span several departments and other support services like HR finance, I legal that uh, in some ways kept going uh, to, to work, doing the job that they were used to doing. And basically our charge on the framework team was uh, operations of everyone that went to work remotely. So um, just as Alan mentioned a team, I had a team of, as well that consisted of two department directors and Allison Hutchins and Carrie Harvell as Dan um, our sister in constant contact during those early days. Uh, the planning department, great example of one department as a whole department, if you will, that was told to go remotely and to get into that mindset of mid um, back is to, as Sean called EDs and directors in for council chambers on March the 16th. And that's when Sean announced the activation of her EOC and basically essential COOP services. Uh, they were identified and all other employees were told to go home and, and work remotely. And if I remember correctly, and Alan, you can tell me later, but I want to say it was about 50, a 50 50 split in the organization. You know, 50% employees were still going to work, still doing the job that they had to go to work to do. Um, and everyone else that didn't have to go to work was told to go home. So, just to be clear, we closed uh, town buildings, but we didn't town work. Um, and although no department was hit harder than the parks department, who basically had to uh, stop or then get in the uh, process of canceling everything. So uh, while they didn't have programs to do, their work really was canceling the things that they had programmed. We initially decided to put the framework in place for 90 days, and that was gonna take us through the end of June. Um, it's kind of crazy now, because no one thought we'd be remote for that long, but five days later, as I counted, I believe, to, uh, we're still going. 90 days actually seemed like a long time, and I, I think I was, with Sean not too long ago, that uh, the first kind of notice to send people home and work remotely only ran through the end of, of April, or I'm sorry, the beginning of April, the end of March. So we basically told people to go home for um, for two uh, two weeks, and then you know it spanned another month, and then we kind of month. But it was just interesting. I, I don't think anyone thought it'd be this long. Our uh, framework team, our charge, I'll say, was pretty simple, and we three main goals. Uh, the first was to provide structure to those working from home. The second was to 
provide communications, especially I'll just say non-emergency communications uh, to the organization. And the third was just to be support uh, for the care. Now, I mean, I want to be clear, and this is from Sean's message, but our main message was about keeping everyone safe. And that's really still the main message uh, that we have today, which is one of the main reasons most of our facilities will remain closed through February. Um, as part of our communications effort, uh, we started our team for started providing Tuesday messages and FAQs, as well as a Friday operational report uh, that really just kind of shared some things on uh, from every department. And we asked every department to uh, submit the items weekly so they could go in that operational report just to kind of keep people in contact with one another. Um, and again, in preparing for tonight, I went back and looked at what our first message that was sent to everyone was. It was uh, March the 24th, and I thought I'd just share a couple of the uh, excerpts from the um, key messages and the FAQ. Uh, we had three key messages that went out that kind of first week um, that we were home, and this is the way it reads. This week was a whirlwind as we all faced wrapping our minds around COVID-19 and how it might impact us personally and professionally. If you're like me, you probably got through last week with an adrenaline rush of figuring out how to work at home. This week, we expect more and different emotions as we continue to adapt to uncertain times. External factors are not in our control and there's no one size fits all approach to our response. We can offer guidance, but not promises. Everyone is looking for slices of certainty when certainty may not exist. You should expect circumstances to continue to change. So we promised people to be authentic and that that's just kind of an example of how our messages went. Um, FAQ, which was really kind of, uh, you know, get, get, uh, gathering questions from people that had them and then providing answers. The first question we got was, um, what should I be working on during this time? And so uh, we told people, unless you've been told otherwise, keep working on what you're already working on. You know, probably was not a time to start something new, but there's not no reason to stop work either. Uh, people asked if they could go to the office. Basically, our answer was no. Um, we did make arrangements if someone needed to get something from their office, but in, in the, uh, under the eyes of safety, we didn't want people going into the office. And then here was a really important one. Um, someone, someone asked about what they should expect about the pace of work. And this was our answer. Said, it's impossible to work at the same pace when you're in the midst of adapting to changing circumstances. Telework is a new habit and skill for most of us, and to that end, every day will be different. Your pace of work will change, and that's okay, we told people. Um, if you're like me and not, uh, not the only one adjusting from working from home, you may have a spouse that's doing the same, children or other family members, uh, and I even said including pets uh, as we're all adjusting together. Basically from that and through discussions around town, uh, some themes started to emerge and as a real good saying emerged, I'll attribute it to Allison. I think it may have came from an article we read, but it was to be generous in our interpretations of others. Um, I think Sean mentioned this, but no one's been through a pandemic before. No one has all the answers. And even though we're in the same pandemic, everyone's experiencing it a little bit differently. So, uh, so next I was going to kind of hit on some of some of what we what we actually were doing. And while these are are certainly not silver linings. Uh, we've had many firsts during uh, during this event. Um, first kind of category I have is how we've continued to serve our citizens. Um, if if you're you know if you had a development plan or project or trying to get a permit, uh, we held virtual um, review committee meetings for the first time ever. Uh, we held virtual building and, and fire inspections where you would um, in certain cases. And this was a first for the fire department would use your iPhone and uh, do do a FaceTime kind of call and show in certain instances what uh, what was being expected. We had virtual bid openings were first and our parks and recreation department. We asked to start looking into virtual programming of which they've held some at this point. Uh, we continued engaging our citizens. We held the first um, virtual council meeting or we had our first virtual quarterly meetings, first neighborhood meetings and after a little bit of pause, um, we held our we went back to holding boards and commissions meetings, even August, and they, those were virtual as well. We've had a virtual team council meeting. Uh, in another category, we continue to interact with our colleagues. 
Sean held, uh, as he's long since done since he's been here, is a virtual all hands where uh, everyone gathers in the council chambers, uh, but those had to be turned into virtual meetings. We had virtual department director meetings. Uh, this was an odd one, especially the first one, Karen's on the call, but I think it was someone from finance uh, retired and the chat feed went crazy, but virtual retirement celebrations. Um, we've shared with each, or, each other um, home offices and how that looks and people, as I mentioned, had, had to uh, learn to share bandwidth with their kids doing virtual school. We certainly got to see people in a different light with uh, longer hair, different colored hair, and uh, sometimes we got a break from our suits and seeing people in uh, t-shirts even, which has been maybe interesting. Uh, we have adjusted some services and adapting to the pandemic. Go Carry services actually increased to 30 minutes on select routes due to increased ridership during this. Um, and I think uh, Sean mentioned 311 and Alan mentioned 311. But we had to recruit um, volunteers uh, from several different departments to assist in the call center because of higher uh, or increased call volumes because everyone was home and more people were calling the town. I think one one group that was maybe impacted the most uh, from from just in the, on an individual level was our school resource officers in the police department, um, and and they had to be reassigned because obviously school was out. So I'm going to share. All right, so hopefully you can see this now. But on the left side was, you know, what a town council of meeting of 2019 looked like. And on the right side is a uh, current town council meeting, which is a virtual setting. And uh, one of our council members isn't present um, as their off-site meeting. Uh, but it's certainly a different look. And you can see the social distancing there. The uh, This next meeting is... Uh, of an advisory volunteer appreciation event. And I guess I could say that's so 2019, because can anyone imagine today, um, you know, sitting around that many people and maybe eating or, or having conversation. So a picture of the mayor, it was an online event, and uh, everyone talked about the, the appreciation we had for our volunteers over the last year. The next was, as we welcome new volunteers in, we used to do that in one of our conference rooms and now we're doing it on a virtual setting and this probably looks very familiar to what you all are doing uh, but it's still kind of unusual just a couple more of these but um, i forget i think our team council is the largest one maybe in the nation um, and all of that's been kind of converted to online after after a brief pause sean mentioned uh well he mentioned some of the things he's doing but virtual all hands this is one of the first ones in a, in a virtual event and then lastly, I just wanted to show you what a department director look, meeting looked like uh, in our council chamber, which I believe holds more than 200 people. Uh, we all had to stagger about. Everyone's wearing masks, and that's in our council chambers, which we could probably just fit that amount of people in there um, to have that type of meeting. So, you know, I mentioned things as they're going on. Lots of that still continue and really didn't stop. And this is the our capital. But uh, Fenton, the Fenton project is currently still under construction, actively under construction. Cary Town Center um, is actively pursuing their development, and I think they just released the name of the mall redevelopment project, which will be called Carolina Yards. We have our project next to the downtown park, one walker, one walnut, or so private development project that's going in surrounding our parking deck, still actually, actually under construction, I believe. Downtown park project uh, in the same area will be bidding soon and going to construction. We're still working on the, the uh, many uh, of Shaping Carries Tomorrow Bond projects. Uh, we've got a downtown multimodal center. Virtual, we're virtually engaging citizens for feedback on that project. And the same with Chapel Hill Road Mobility Study, uh, virtually engaging citizens. So, you know, so I, the theme of this is, well, it's been different for sure. The work of the carry machine continues. And, uh, the, you know, I, I want to kind of bridge this gap literally is uh, between the work of the uh, framework team and the EOC, we had daily calls together with Sean and Susan Moran, who acted as a bridge for information between our two areas, especially when it came to dealing with gray areas. Uh, you know, Sean mentioned it a bit, but Sean's council was uh, Sean's focus was on the council and working to stay in contact with neighboring municipalities, which really was just invaluable for feeding us all information of, of learning how others are, were doing things especially in the early weeks. Um, we've learned a lot together. There's still a lot to get to know. 
I, I, I was going to say, it ha you know, it hasn't all been roses, but we're very fortunate to be in Cary, North Carolina. Um, and I know I'm not going to, I'm certainly not one to take for granted how much my colleagues care about the work that they all do. So I just think we're very lucky for that. Um, and while some people, you know, really love the virtual environment, other people are struggling. Uh, we've certainly tried to do our part in keeping check on employees kind of regularly. And I know that's been a huge uh, kind of mission of Brene Poole and our HR department, as well as all the department directors. But our carry culture that Sean mentioned is brought to the organization is one of bringing your whole self to work. And, you know, our belief is you can still do that even in a pandemic. So the goals I mentioned at the beginning are for the framework team are still in place now. That's providing structure for those working at home, continue to communicate with people. Um, although it's only one email per week now, and su support the team. I think that's very important to do. Um, I do think these things are a little more settled than they were six months ago. And while I hope our citizens don't feel any drops in service, uh, you know, I hope uh, maybe you guys will please let us know if you do, as Sean mentioned, uh, you know, we can't fix what we don't know. So uh, it's certainly still many unknowns, still many hard conversations, and I imagine you'll hear that from Karen uh, here as she touches on the budget conversation, but thanks for your time tonight. Thanks, Russ. It is exciting to hear about the projects we have managed to keep pushing forward during this challenging year. And speaking of challenges, one big challenge that came as a result of COVID-19 was, of course, our budget. So our final speaker tonight is Chief Financial Officer Karen Mills. So, um, Karen, what can you tell us about how our budget and budget process changed for this fiscal year? Thanks, Carla. So, the budget really is a cornerstone of our operations. It authorizes all of the spending that we need to serve our citizens. And a government budget is different than uh, your personal budget or your corporate budget because it is a law. It's not a target. We really can't go over authorized total. So how we allocate that money says everything about our priorities, talks about our values, it defines our service levels. And because of that, the process is really important in developing that budget, and we seek public input all year round. Of course, it's tough because there's never enough to do everything we'd like to do, even in a normal year. So for just a little bit of Budget 101, our financial year runs uh, begins July 1 and runs through June 30th. The budget for this fiscal year, um, ending June 30, 2021, totals over $400 million. And it's divided into two main functions. The utility fund is, every, is everything water and sewer, and it runs more like a business. The general fund is pretty much everything else, streets, parks, police, fire, solid waste. And then each of these functions has two budgets one for day-to-day -day operations, and the second for capital construction. So expenditures for salaries or gas for solid waste trucks, water treatment chemicals are examples of the operating budget costs, and they make up about two thirds of that $400 million total. And the remaining one third goes for capital construction and large equipment like fire trucks, and parks, street resurfacing, new sidewalks, or refurbishing a water tank. But the total budget changes every year because of that capital spending that changes. We have a 20-year plan for our capital needs and 10-year projections for our operating budget. So you can find a ton of details about the budget on our website now, and we're working on a final budget document, so there'll be even more details there um, by the end of this month. But our budget process, um, like all the other things that you've heard tonight, has really been an evolution. Um, we were making um, tremendous progress towards involving everyone in making budget decisions. It wasn't just a matter of the finance department and the town manager and deciding what to recommend to council. We got all of the department directors involved in juggling priorities. And we were on that path again this year and then um, the pandemic. So we had to kind of step back to the old school way and uh, the finance department began running over a dozen different scenarios. Ultimately, um, we could really see two key principles rising to the top of the discussions about what we needed to do. 
We strongly believe that our citizens needed us to hold steady on operations. They needed the solid waste to keep, keep coming. They obviously expected public safety to continue. And development business um, wanted to stay, stay open and continue. At the same time, we wanted to continue to push forward on capital investments that had been planned. Just a few months before, in October of 2019, our Kerry voters strongly approved the Shaping Kerry Tomorrow bond referendum. And um, so we knew that citizens felt strongly about those improvements as well. This was a tough choice, given that in May, we were estimating we'd have about a million dollars less in revenue for operations on just the general fund side. A carry started out and has a history of very strong financial position and the very best credit ratings after many years of good financial management, good human decisions about um, what our priorities are. And as I mentioned, we have long-term capital plans and long-term operating plans. So what we did was we held on to the values that got us here and then um, council made a tough, tough choice when we talk about revaluation, the value of property that we base our taxes on, it stays the same for a period of years, and then account, the county conducts a revaluation. Wake County now conducts um, that every four years, and that's to rebalance the value. Because while we're lucky in the triangle and everything has, generally goes up, it doesn't all go up at the same rate. For example, with all of the downtown revitalization work that um, has been going on, our downtown property values have gone up more like 50% and other neighborhoods increased less than 10%. And with the revaluation, that adjusts everyone's tax base to recognize those changes. So Wake County conducted that reval as of January 1 and that impacts um, the budget that we were setting for the year beginning July 1. So Cary's total value went up about 20%. And for the first time in Kerry's history, um, we didn't lower the tax rate to account for that growth. Because of the revenue shortfalls in sales tax, parks, occupancy tax, to maintain the services that we felt citizens um, wanted and expected, we needed more revenue. So those taxes helped balance the budget this year. And then when COVID is over and things begin to return to normal, and those revenues grow again, they'll help pay for the new debt payments that we will have as we move forward on the capital investments from the Shaping Carry Tomorrow Bonds, and we'll start to have debt service and that those revenues will help absorb, absorb those costs. So it was also a little bit easier to keep that 35 cent tax rate because before, um, in last year, Carry had the lowest municipal rate in Wake County and even after the revaluation, Kerry still has the lowest municipal rate in Wake County. Um, to help offset the impact of the tax rate on our citizens, council voted to decrease um, the utility volume charges. We were able to do that because we've had some better years than expected in utility demand. We had a wet, um, a very dry fall and our irrigation demand had been up. So for as a result, for a homeowner that had for example, a $380,000 home and used 5,000 gallons of water, um, their taxes offset with the uh, um, utility rate decrease, their net impact for their costs was only 6.2%. Part of um, you know, managing the budget is not just uh, bringing more revenue to the picture, we did not budget for any salary increases for our employees. We didn't budget for any new employees, despite the fact that seven to eight people still move into carry every single day of the year. And that really hasn't changed during the pandemic. So as I mentioned, we're still pushing forward on the capital projects authorized and um, that debt service will be coming on in the future, as I mentioned. So let's look just a little bit at outcomes and how these um, budget projections are coming to pass. Well, we don't find out about our sales tax revenue for two and a half months. So we only have information through June, which actually um, was for FY20. And this chart compares our FY20 sales tax to the year before FY2019. And so you can clearly see when the COVID, when COVID hit, 
and our sales tax revenues dropped in March and um, even further in April, rebounded a little bit in May. Um, but it's a good thing I'm not um, someone who makes a lot of bets because I would have lost the bet on the June sales tax number. Um, quite frankly, those surprised us. It was actually um, in June, sales tax were 7% over the prior year. And um, they had been averaging about 9% prior to prior to March. And we, we don't know whether this is some pent up demand when the stay at home orders were relaxed, whether things were delayed in processing at the state or whether they're a sign of the economy, but we're hoping that it bodes well for this year, which would be good news because um, we did anticipate a 20% decrease in sales tax for FY21, but we also thought we'd be back to normal in parks and rec and cultural resource revenues. And so I'm hoping that if we make a little more in sales tax than we expected, it will um, make up for our delays in restarting our parks and rec programs that generate um, some revenue for us. Um, when we look at 21, based on what we know now, um, like I said, we're hoping for a little more positive outlook on sales tax. Permits and fees, we did um, anticipate a decrease and we're on track with that. With utility billing, we're on track. We've um, actually experienced small increases in residential usage. Like we have a large number of residential accounts everybody's bill has gone up just a little bit because they're working at home and that those revenue increases, small increases on a large number of accounts has made up for larger decreases on a smaller number of commercial accounts or offices that have been closed and um, using less water. So our utility um, revenues are on track with, with history. Um, our occupancy tax is a million dollar budget. And um, I don't think we'll, we'll make our 20% um, anticipate 20% cut, and I don't think we'll make that. But again, um, we're hoping to keep the budget balanced overall. And um, as I mentioned, Parks and Rec is going to be under budget. But all in all, it's a typical carry picture where a prudent approach is paying off and keeping us on track and whole. I want to talk just a minute about. Um, Utilities. Uh, the governor um, asked all utilities not to conduct any disconnections for non payment, late fees, or anything like that. We had already started that um, in anticipation of our citizens' needs before that came along. But um, you know, that governor's order has been lifted. However, we have not yet restarted disconnections, late fees, or anything. We want to work with our citizens. So in September, for um, the 2,000 uh, residential accounts who were just been building up some delinquent balances, we sent them a payment plan automatically, 12 months, no, no penalties, no interest. And then we will um, work with them to find them assistance programs that we can. There's a program at Wake County called Wake Cares. We have an OASIS program that um, Dorcas Ministries administers for us. And so we're trying to help people find money to pay those bills. Um, and then if we still haven't heard from anyone, then we will begin disconnections for non-payment in January. But we're gonna do everything that we can to communicate with our customers stay in touch. Um, that total delinquent balance was about a million dollars, but because the utility is in great shape, it will not threaten our ability to continue to provide excellent water and sewer service. So that's in a nutshell, um, the budget for FY21 and an outlook for where we are. And with that, I'm happy to take questions as Carla um, leads us through that. So thanks, Carla. Thank you so much, Karen. We are very grateful for all, all the hard work from you and your team. And it was very good to hear from all of our different speakers tonight. I appreciate everyone's time. And it looks like 
I think all of our presenters are still on. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> so it looks like everyone's here for questions. Um, the first question comes from Bob. He is asking us to speak to any support for upcoming early voting to make things go as smoothly as possible. Alan, you want to take that one? Sure. Bob, thanks for your uh, thanks for your question. Um, actually, your, uh, your your question is very relevant. Um, as over the uh, past uh, two days, uh, at the direction of our manager, Mr. Stiegel, um, our emergency operations center, although it's not activated at the moment, we do have a, a number of staff. And Carla mentioned earlier that she served in the EOC in the planning section, and so we have the planning section or members of our planning section who are doing work now. Uh, working uh, with town staff, particularly our police department and uh, our town clerk, uh, Jenny Johnson, who is also to the town's staff liaison to the Wake County um, Board of Elections. And so we've been um, uh, conducting uh, facility assessments and making sure that everyone's uh, aware of uh, when and how voting will occur this year. And it will, it will be occur like many other things that you've heard tonight, um, voting will be different than it has been uh, in the past, and so um, town staff are making plans to uh, to do that. We do. I think the question does talk about early voting, and so there are two. There are two early voting um, uh, stations in town. One is at the Herb Young Community Center, and the other is at uh, the Senior Center at Bob Park. And I, um, I better not. I, I, uh, I, I want to say that of the dates that they start, and if someone else is on the call that. Um, that can um, that can clarify that. I'm almost positive it's uh, October 19th through the uh, end of the uh, end, uh, October 19th through the 30th or 31st, whatever that happens to be uh, that that last Friday. So within that uh, couple of week period or week and a half period, and so we have those two early voting stations, and then uh, on um, on November the third, voting uh, election day, uh, uh, the senior center. Site drops off. Herb Young uh, remains a, a polling station, as as do three of the fire stations throughout town. And again, we are working closely with the board of directions to outfit and configure um, uh, these polling places to facilitate uh, uh, what we expect and anticipate to be a large number of voters in and out of facilities. So there are a lot of planning, a lot of support uh, for that. So that's the update I can give on uh, voting. And do you want me to go to the second question, Carla? And sure, you can, sure so you can jump right into that one, just so everybody's aware the question was, has COVID caused changes in the way the town operates that will continue after COVID? Yeah, I, um, I, uh, I, my, my personal guess is, is yes, they will. And Russ did a really neat job earlier of talking about the different ways that the normal town um, a function, what, what I would consider normal town function or non-emergency town functions uh, operate and have changed. He gave a number of examples, especially on the development process and inspection process. Uh, uh, we've, I think town has, uh, town staff have um, identified a number of efficiencies uh, for both town staff and for uh, applicants in the development process um, with virtualizing a number of those steps. And so I cannot imagine us going back to a, um, uh, a, a non-technology-based, more human uh, resource-based, uh, and thereby more expensive, um, uh, more expensive process than we are now. So there are a number of processes that I think are are here to stay for that. And so, in addition to that, um, all of the uh, department directors within town and their staffs over the last couple of months, they've been working um, within what we call our catalog, and it is a a, a, a database full of programs and services to evaluate those uh, programs and services for future use. And so we, we've been looking at them through the lens of COVID, how those things might change in the future. So access to um, town facilities, I suspect will 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 change in the future, even after um, this, uh, the pandemic em uh, element of, um, of COVID-19 um, uh, passes. I think that we will see um, more barriers uh, between uh, staff and, and the public and limited um, opportunities um, uh, to, to interact and for, and for um, um, I don't want to say, um, to, to, to limit the spread of any virus regardless. I think that 
COVID-19 is just going to change the way that we interact on a, a personal basis uh, to begin with. That that on some of our uh, programs and services, that's okay. But um, for many of the uh, for many of the towns' uh, services, um, you know, local government is the closest uh, form of government to the people and provide those closest services to the people. And so, um, firefighters, sanitation workers, police officers, parks and rec and cultural resources uh, people, we, we interact with people, and so. Um, we're, we'll, we will I most definitely do those things differently in the future. And so that's kind of like on the uh, micro operational level. In addition to that, um, our manager, Mr. Stiegel, uh, and Karen talked about the budget earlier with his budget message to town staff back in June. He, he did call on town staff to, again, utilize our catalog for evaluation of programs and services to identify areas that we might create greater efficiencies. And what we have seen over the last seven months is that some of our services that we um, provided prior to COVID, um, the importance of those to the community uh, may, no, may no longer exist. And so um, we, we may go on a um, program and service diet, for lack of a better term, in the future, and that will have um, fiscal uh, benefits uh, to, the, to the town as well. And um, got a note from Russ, uh, early voting starts on the 15th, not the 19th. So our, correct my earlier statement. I'll add something to what Alan's talking about, how business changes. Um, we already had a lot of online services for our citizens regarding particularly in utilities, um, getting your bill electronically, paying um, through a number of means electronically, and certainly more of our citizens have chosen to use those means of um, working with us because the the town hall has been closed and the counter has been closed. So um, they're learning more about the online ways to pay their tax bills, those sorts of things. Also in our own internal operations, uh, we were already working to, um, towards paperless processes. And this really um, moved up our thinking about how to do business without paper, all remote from home. We were already working on laptops and so it was seamless to just go work at home um, but we had still relied on printers i think um, more out of um, comfort uh, when we were in the office and so much of that um, we found new ways to do business and it's it's great and that will last forever we're really proud of some of the changes we've made thank you karen and alan um kristen is asking she said she's interested to hear any trends you can share on the types of 311 calls. Um, I think there, uh, the majority of the calls I would put into kind of the general category of they bother you because you're home, um, <laughs> to be honest. And, and, and again, so these are, these are normally the types of, not that, and I, I don't say that to diminish them. It's just meaning that, meaning more that they're just present because there's a lot more eyes on things and people have more flexibility in schedule. And so a um, lot more re requests regarding um, maybe like trees that look like they could be dying, tree branches, things, um, uh, things about our, a lot more people are using our greenways. So some imperfections on our greenways, things of, things of that order. So it's like having thousands and thousands and thousands of more town employees out and about looking for imperfections. And so what's been great is our citizens have understood that we'll note those things, but many of those things we, we won't, um, the, the community can't afford to fix all of those things all at once, but they will be addressed over time in a, in a logical fashion. So it has been, it has been interesting, but we are happy to have people using uh, 311 in in a way that allows them to get the types of answers that they need. Also, there's been just a lot of just people needing information just and turning to us to help them get information, not only about town of carry programs, but about things that are going on uh, with the state, with the county, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of darking bog, uh, barking dog calls too. <laughs> yeah, but mo most of those have been from me. <laughs> I guess you pay attention to that more when you're at home too, right? <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right. It looks like we have a question from Harvey. Um, what triggers the opening of the EOC? How is the incident identified 
Does a document is there a document available that identifies the roles and functions of members? So I'll take that one. Okay. So um, um, can you scroll back up? So how 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 is it active? Is it how's the EOC activated? And so there's there's not a hard and fast algorithm algorithm or or um, um, or, or equation to do that. It's really a, a judgment decision based upon uh, the recommendation generally from the uh, fire chief or the police chief. But here are the considerations. If, if, if the town is faced with um, a large scale, either natural uh, or, or man-made uh, disaster, or in the, in the case of COVID, this public health emergency, whenever we recognize that um, more than one town department is gonna be engaged in a response over a long period of time, where, where uh, coordination and communication and decision making uh, really needs uh, needs to be uh, highly structured and focused to respond to that. That's the those are the co uh, considerations for activating the EOC, and it, it's a it's really a recommendation in my role. And I've, we've had this. The town has had this role, the director of public safety, for two years now, and um, and this activation through for COVID was really the first formal and the longest uh, EOC activation that the town has uh, has ever engaged in. And so it literally came with a recommendation from me uh, to the town manager to do that. And we then incorporated that into um, Mayor Weinbrecht's uh, state uh, state of emergency uh, that he declared. And so court, when, when coordination, communication, and decision-making really needs to be focused for, uh, for an event or a disaster, those are the, those are the triggers. And oh, in terms of roles, specific roles, our our EOC is based upon what is known as the uh, NIMS ICS model. That's the National Incident Management System um, ICS Incident Command System model. And you can um, you as a citizen can go to FEMA's um, independent um, uh, independent uh, training exercises uh, online uh, training exercises that they have on FEMA's DHS uh, website. And you can actually uh, go through much of the training that many of the town staff um, uh, conduct and complete in order to know and understand uh, those roles and responsibilities. Thank you, Alan. Um, it looks like this next one might be another one for you. <laughs> okay. Vera is asking, since Cary is seamlessly connected with neighboring towns, particularly Morrisville and Apex, what kind of synergy and best practices shared in combating COVID-19? Well, I'll, I'll take a uh, I'll take a shot at this, but I actually think um, this this might um, that, that, that either if the mayor's still with us or Sean, they may have some um, uh, some input on this as well. Because when I see that question, I think about uh, particularly in March and April, whenever we um, whenever there were so many unknowns about the pandemic and the virus itself, there was there was a lot of effort um, among uh, all the all the towns, but particularly Apex, uh, Cary, and Morseville to stay on the same page in terms of policy decisions. So the things that, um, the dis policy decisions that were made in Cary did not negatively impact um, our neighbors and, and vice versa. And so there is an interesting story behind that and maybe um, the, the mayor, Sean, can speak to that. Um, uh, likewise, um, with, our, um, uh, with our public safety agencies and particularly with the fire departments between uh, Apex, Morsel and Cary, uh, they were already engaged in some regional activities, regional operational activities um, prior to COVID. And, um, and so where we respond um, automatically with them, we train and respond automatically with them on, on particular calls. And so there are many, many times, whether it's a, a fire or emergency medical call or rescue call, where you're going to see all of those, um, all of those public, uh, all those fire department uh, units respond collectively and, and, to, and together. I'm, I'm not sure about we've learned enough to know about what might be best practices yet, but we certainly have had some successes with um, with, with those activities. Alan, I'll, I'll join in on the uh, policy part of it. Back in March, uh, one of the things I remember is Wake County mayors were having daily calls. And as I was talking with them, I was talking with Sean about the uh, impacts of decisions. And one of the things we talked about was consistency and enforcement. A lot of the municipalities wanted to 
uh, goes stronger than state uh, enforcement or state requirements. And uh, we knew we couldn't enforce those. And uh, it would be inconsistent with the state message, which created confusion. And so I know that uh, Apex Mayor and the Marsville Mayor especially and I talk daily about that and try to be as consistent as possible and then spent time trying to convince the uh, Wake County contingent and the Raleigh contingent to join us in certain things. I know that uh, uh, they had deadlines and I remember Sean and I being on the phone up until literally the last seconds before they're gonna send out a public service announcement on certain issues, but it was that kind of uh, environment back in that time. And uh, one of the things Sean and I talked about early on was the long-term impacts. And we both realized that this was a multi-month uh, pandemic. This wasn't gonna be a couple of months. And I believe some of the leaders back then thought that this would be a couple of months and it'd be over. And we realized that's not the case. And how do we plan and make plans uh, to be consistent and to carry this forward knowing that it has impacts on safety, enforcement, mental health, physical health, et cetera. And uh, we, I was proud of the EOC and their recommendations uh, as we went forward to help us be the best we can be. And the numbers you showed earlier, I think reflects uh, the decisions and the actions of the EOC with us having the lowest infection rate of a thousand people. And I don't know if Sean wants to uh, jump in and add to that, but uh, it, it was it was a great team effort uh, for sure. It uh, sure, thanks, Mayor. I think uh, you know to embarrass the mayor a little bit. I, I uh, we were also proud of him um, as he uh, was able to realize kind of halfway through that the other mayors of the we'll call them the Raleigh suburbs, um, for lack of a better term, really do um, look up to carry for leadership. And they were the other mayors were looking up to Mayor Weinbrock. Not only is he um, an experienced mayor, but he um, is the mayor of a very large and sophisticated organization that um, has served in a leadership capacity for decades. And the other communities, the other growing communities, the Apex, Morrisville, et cetera, have modeled themselves in many ways after Kerry. And so it um, they were following our lead to a large degree, and really the 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 approach that we took was one that's consistent with Kerry's values for quite some time. I mean, if you look at due to the influence of SAS and certainly, you know, IBM, this is this is a community that has a strong preference to kind of data-based rational decision making. Yeah, and not that emotions and feelings can't play into an effective decision making process because they can. But at the end of the day, what is the data show? What makes sense for Kerry? And let's not be influenced by really um, speaking candidly nonsense conversations that are born out of more de Democrat and Republican kind of playbooks than really what makes sense for the town of Kerry and our citizens. And and really appreciate the mayor and the council's leadership in that role of continuing to embrace this as a decision making process that is very different than the one that you see when you uh, maybe like turn on your television. Um, so that that was uh, really good. And also, too, uh, there has to be um, some of the court, some of the decisions had to be coordinated at, to some degree with the Morrisville and Apex in particular. Because we do the the employees work well together, but they, we also compete for employees. Okay, and so um, there was a there was a need for us to try to make some of our decisions as it impacted not only the people that had to work from home, but also the people out in the field. You know how we would address this and try to do it in a way that was um, as consistent as possible. But I will tell you again, we led because I know as much as I want to work well with. Um, Morrisville and with Apex. My wife is the planning director in Morrisville. And she's on a virtual call right now too. Um, that we weren't going to lower our standards to meet theirs. So they had to bring theirs up. And they didn't have to bring them up a lot because they're great employers as well. But we really, um, as you can see on this call, it's important for us to be the highest performing local government. And to do that, you need to have the best employees. 
And, um, and so that was a, another way that we worked well with our neighbors. All right. Thank you all so much. Looks like Vera had another question. We have faced some technology challenges in this session. Yes, we have, I am sorry. <laughs> Can someone comment on how the schools are able to do online sessions successfully? Carla, can I answer that question? <laughs> and I, so I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, during the course of this call, I was in, at town hall when I presented. I stayed there for a while. I drove home, stayed connected the whole time, walked in, walked in right to my daughter who was doing her homework at the kitchen table and said, how are you able to make <laughs> go to school successfully when you're having all these technology problems? And and she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, for like right now, uh, Carla's trying to get Russ's attention and he can't hear her. Um, and so we kind of both laughed about that and then and, and talked about the fact that um, there is certainly a, a pandemic curve that the whole world has had to adjust to. And so Russ and I have been communicating throughout this that we know how much Carla cares about this and all of us do too. But the technological difficulties will bother Carla a lot because she's a very um, ambitious and caring young professional. But that it's okay that that people are making those adjustments. People understand those for those children who happen to be in some of the more important years. I mean, they're all important. The kindergarten, first grade. I think there's a lot of evidence out there that that's you know more important than maybe fourth grade as far as the kind of the the continuing. Uh, learning and education process. I'm certainly not an educator or, or an expert. I'm just a dad that has seen his um, his high school freshman, uh, I think, do a very good job of pretending that she's focused um, when um, I think the reality might be something different. Right, Emma? Well, she can't hear me now. But um, so uh, I, I think that the Wake County schools are doing the best, the best job that they can. Um, and certainly the same goes through Chatham. But again, I think there is pandemic expectations, which aren't the same. And I think people are still betting on the fact that um, this too shall pass. And in the longer term, most kids will be able to catch up. Most parents will be able to catch up. But unfortunately for some, there's going to be longer term effects. There's no question. Hey, and Sean, I was going to add, uh, this kind of relates to 311 questions, but one of, one of the uh, calls we get a lot of is uh, right-of-way complaints and utility complaints, so like fiber companies. I was only going to add to it that I think we're kind of in a lucky kind of sweet spot, as painful as that's been, and they've torn up my yard as well, and I'm on gigabit uh, service and still having problems apparently tonight. Uh, but I think we're pretty lucky in the area and, and, and maybe lucky that that came in while it did uh, and a lot of those services in advance of the pandemic. Um, to be able to have that type of service that we we that most uh, carry citizens kind of have in their in their uh, to their house. Thank you guys, and again, we do appreciate everyone bearing with us with our COVID expectations. <laughs> um, our next question is from Megan. Megan asks, um, COVID has brought on an increase in single-use plastics across the country. This comes at a time when we are already working to address the quickly filling landfill. Are there plans to continue to educate residents about limiting single use in the age of COVID? You know, Megan, I will tell you that um, in all things sustainability, um, not only myself, but the people on this call, we have a lot of room to improve. Okay, and the reason why I say we have a lot of room to improve is I think we're doing a pretty good job of um, our sustainability efforts relative to other communities. But the talent and the capabilities of the Town of Kerry staff can and we will be producing much more as um, conversations over the last couple months have really garnered our focus. And that's been one area where COVID has helped. And you're right. Um, you know, plastic wasn't something that I thought an awful lot about just a year ago. And for any of anyone on this call that hasn't at least watched one documentary on the plastics problem in this country, it's terrifying, and as a public servant or as a community member, um, and you have any kind of, I would say, some sort of conscious or caring about the future, something has to be done. And again, as I talked about with a, with the example with the mayor and Kerry, we know that when Kerry does things, it has an impact larger than even Kerry. Um, I mentioned early on that I had the 
noticed, paid attention and studied and followed Carrie for many years and, and use it as a model community. And so we really think that this is an area that we can do more. So the answer to you is yes. Um, the answer is there's a lot more we can do in sustainability. And we plan on being a leader in that area, which isn't to say we're not doing a lot now, but there's a lot more capacity and a lot more good things to come in the future, including really starting to citizens about their practices. Hey, and Sean, I'll add, you know, since we can't see Megan, but uh, to put a face to a name, Megan uh, works with Towards Zero Waste. And we hope, Megan, I hope you're listening, is that, you know, I think you've met with Dana and others, but we hope we can learn from your group and partner with your group to, uh, to, to continue to learn and do better. Yes, I've had the pleasure of meeting with Megan as well. So thank you guys. Um, I think we've got time for this last question. It's actually a really great one to end on from Ashley. She would like to hear briefly from each panelist what their motivation is to work in public service. Would anyone like to kick us off? Karen, thank you. So um, one thing I've, I've learned a lot about myself over the years, and I know that um, I show my heart through service and that I like to problem solve. And so my ability to know what's going on, I'm a little nosy. Um, if I know what the construction project is down the street and I can help a neighbor find out some information about that or um, connect them with the resources that they need, um, talk to them about a toilet leak, then I really like to be in that role. And um, what has kept me in public service for 29 years at the town of Cary is my immense pride in um, our organizational culture and that we have always worked to do the right things for the right reason. And um, it's such a privilege to work with so many like-minded um, folks who just really want to do a great job um, in a smart way. And um, it's a privilege to learn from them every day. So that's what keeps me. Well, let's follow up on Karen's comments. That's. <laughs> That's great. I've lived in Cary for decades, and and I've enjoyed the great decision uh, decisions of the policymakers and the people who worked for the town for many many years. And it was my desire to not only keep Cary great, but to see if we can make it better. And I've also learned um, from watching. Uh, I actually had an uncle who was mayor. But watching um, many elected officials and have learned that, hey, if, if we get rid of party politics and we all work together, then we can make good decisions. And if we have a great staff and if we have a great business community and we all work together, great things can happen. And that's why I'm still in it, because we're starting to see great things happen. And I'm excited about that. And and. Uh, I've been in the mayor role for 13 years, and I can't believe I've been in the mayor role 13 years because it's been a lot of fun. We have a council uh, that I think is second to none. We all work together, we all collaborate, and none of us think alike. And we have a staff that ha is made up of the best of the best and is run by a great leader. And we have a chamber of commerce who works closely with us to try to uh, we try to help each other in making Cary greater than it is today. So I'm really fortunate and really blessed uh, to be a part of this organization. And I think feeling like that has a lot to do with why we're able to do great things. And, and we're blessed to have you, Karen. And and we're glad of all. For those of you who don't know, every time Karen comes speaks in front of council, she's talking about how many millions we're going to save. Uh, that's how great of a job she's doing. So thank you for all you do, Karen. And thanks to all of the staff for all they do, making Karen great. Thank you, Mayor. That's a tough one to follow, too. Alan, <laughs> you want to give it a shot? Sure. And I, I've, I've had to adjust a little bit of my thinking after I reread the question, but um, that my motivation to work in public service. And so uh, um, um, I, my public service career actually started before I had, um, I thought about the motiva motivation to do it. Uh, so next month is my 40th year 
um, uh, doing public service work. I started in high school as a volunteer firefighter. And um, I stay, I kept doing that because it's incredibly fun. You have absolutely no idea how much fun it is to ride on the fire truck, uh, screaming down the road uh, with lights and siren going, it, it's, it, especially as a 16 year old. So I was hooked really from, uh, from the beginning. And from there, that, that simply translated into um, a paid firefighter position with the city of Fayetteville a long time ago and i've just i've just stuck with it and so um the fire service itself um you you meet lots of interesting people and every day is a different challenge and um uh, by nature i'm a problem solver by nature i like math and science and that's what um the fire service was about those were my early uh, those were my er uh, early pinnings underpinnings of that and then uh, through my formal education i, I became um uh, more interested in um, both public policy and continuous improvement, uh, process improvement, and those types of things, and there are a lot of opportunities to, to do that. To do that, not only in the fire service, to put some science behind how we uh, um, uh, formulate our our policy decisions on providing those uh, services, but now I get an opportunity to do that um, um, on a on a larger scale across uh, other disciplines as well with with this new role. So. It's, 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 there, it's fun to work with people and for people and serve people. And so that's what, that's what motivates me. That's definitely what it's all about. Thanks, Alan. Russ, would you like to go? Ah, sure, I'll go. Um, it's funny, Alan kind of started where he did. I think Sean and I kind of had this conversation, or maybe many of us have, because when you start out in local government, especially as a young person, I don't think you, well, one, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so you kind of grow into that motivation of why it kind of keeps you there. Um, and, and I'd also say why some people leave the profession um, that, that we see. But for me, uh, my background is what or is was in civil engineering. And I loved um, very quickly saw that I, well, I love building things and I love kind of this problem solving kind of aspect to the job and very quickly saw that the things that you get to build and carry, uh, you get to see people use them. So there's kind of a bit of a joy to that. So uh, I like to believe we, we are very good at um, solving people's problems. And, and Sean came in with this, I won't steal his thunder, but solving problems before they exist. So wow, we can not only think about t solving today's problems, which is what the organization has been very good at through the years, now we're thinking of solving problems well into the future. Um, so I, I just like that aspect of it, I think motivates me. Thanks, Russ. Sean, are you still with us? I'm, I'm here to the bitter end. <laughs> um, you know, my my both my mother and grandmother, who were the, the dominant figures in my uh, childhood, were both social workers. And and so seeing um, the satisfaction that they got from uh, serving others, that they were also very, um, very active in participating in their local government. And and so it really. Um, I don't know if that I always just knew that I would um, serve in government. I knew that I wanted to work in lo local government, and I knew that I wasn't probably the picture of anyone's cop or firefighter. So I thought that kind of working in more of an administrative role would would suit me best. And I have a I have a passion for um, serving elected officials. You know, um, elected officials in this country generally speaking, get a lot of flack, and certainly a lot of that is deserved. But there are still many, 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 many people, and certainly there are seven in Cary that give um, give their time away from their families, away from their businesses, and make a very um, selfless decision to put themselves out there to public scrutiny and criticism in order to serve their community. And so I, I will admit before I came to Cary, I had many moments where I'm like, well, you know, I could, you know, I could go work at Cisco. What am I doing? Um, and it was all instantly restored the minute I walked into um, 316 North Academy. And so it's, um, you know, being a part of something that is uh, helping the greater good, which is, can be done at a very high level in local government and especially in Cary. That's awesome. That's a perfect note to end on. I think we're going to wrap up just in time. I want to thank everyone again, all of our presenters for being here.
for staying on the whole time. <laughs> and thank you to all of the Carrie 101 students for participating. We know that Carrie would not be Carrie without people like you. Thanks everybody and good night.